Good morning and welcome to Palestine United Methodist Church. And for those of you on Facebook, I, I keep trying to kind of keep up with where, where y'all are located at. And now you're up a little ways and I kind of like that. Kind of like it. Um, <laughs> glad you're with us this morning and so glad to be able to see all of y'all. Linda, I didn't get to say hi to you. Good morning. You had a good week? Good. And we're glad that Timothy is behaving himself, even though his birthday was yesterday. Mm -hmm. He was what? Oh, he did. So you're, are you feeling a little more mature today than you were maybe two days ago? Nope. <laughs> I didn't think so. The day that you do is the day that we're going to be really sad. <laughs> I think so. We're glad that y'all are with us this morning, and um, glad that Melly is with us this morning, and um, I, I just love it when you come. We just really do, and hope you can come more, and hope Rusty's doing better, and Grace will be awake next time so she can come too. She's such a sweetheart. Announcements are in the bulletin. Um, <clears throat> Wednesday night, we're still in a Bible study by James W. Moore that's titled The Crosswalk, and it's an Advent, I'm Advent, it's a Lent, <laughs> it's a Lenten uh, study, and that's it, uh, that's on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook, and 8.15 to 8.30, we still have uh, our coffee time on Sunday mornings. Palm Sunday Union service is next Sunday, and that'll be at 6 p.m. right here, and we're just thrilled that all the churches are going to be able to come and be with us. I'm sure it's not going to be the crowd like it used to be 10 years ago, but it's always a really, really, really good worship service. So with all those people coming, then that means Saturday at what, 9, 9.30, if anyone would like to come and help clean up the church, then you are more than welcome to come. We'd, be lo we'd, we'd just love to have you. We'll just, um, it's, it's, not, it's not too bad, but, you know, we'd, we'd just like to kind of fluff it up a little bit for spring. Uh, Good Friday service is April 7th at 6 p.m., and then we'll have Easter breakfast at 8 a.m. on April 9th. Easter worship service is at 9.30 a.m. April 9th, and then April 16th, we'll have our PPR board meeting, and that'll be immediately following worship service. Are there any other announcements I have forgotten or left out? You mean I didn't forget anything? I'm kind of concerned about me. Tim had a birthday yesterday, and it's only fitting that we sing happy birthday to him. Yes, it is. We only get to do this once a year for you. Happy, happy birthday to birthday to you. Happy birthday, birth, happy birthday to birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tim. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Don't, don't encourage him. I'm just glad you're here, but I told you. So what color hair dye do you use? <laughs> oh my gosh. What'd you say, Robert? I probably did. You think he is? 
Well, I think it's probably about time that we bowed and said the prayer that's in the bulletin. God of power and mercy, we are sometimes so sure that things will not work out. We doubt even your ability to put things right in our lives. We lack the faith we desire most to honor you. Remind us once again that you shared with us your most precious gift in Jesus Christ. Help us to model our lives after his messages of compassion and service. Hear our doubts and remind us that Jesus overcame death to bring salvation, hope, trust, and a resurrection in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And our call to worship is Psalm 130. It's on page 848 in the hymnal. Psalm 130, and it's on page 848 in our hymnal. <clears throat> Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be worshipped. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. Amen. I think Jim has a few thoughts for us this morning. I came to a realization this week, after last week, that why do I even make notes if I'm not going to bring them with me? And I'll, you know, I'll bring them, but I don't look at them. So I've got to start looking at my notes. The second thing I came to really understand is that I shouldn't expect to memorize five pages or six pages, and I don't think you expect me to. So, with that being said, my father, years ago, when I was a teenager, I would get in the habit of telling him something, and I'd be going real fast, and I'd run over the top of things, and he'd say, whoa, 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 whoa. He said, now back that up, and let's come again. So I'm going to back up and come again on some of that last week to make it, hopefully, a whole lot better than it was. The chronology of Joseph. The Hebrew word is pronounced Yosef, Yosef, Y-O-S-E-F, and the Long O and long E. His father was Jacob. His mother, his mother was Rachel. Rachel had two children. It was Joseph and then Benjamin. She died in childbirth with Benjamin. The other ten were by Jacob's first wife, who was Leah. Joseph's grandfather was Isaac. His great-grandfather was Abraham. He had one sister, half-sister, and that was Dinah. The brothers, you'll recognize the names of most, I'm sure. Reuben was the oldest. And also, we'll hear Reuben's name a little bit later on. He was kind of a character. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulon, Gad, Naphtali, Dan, Issachar, Asher, and Benjamin were, were the, the brothers and half-brothers. Joseph was a shepherd. Well, that was kind of his title. But... Jacob favored Joseph over the other, other children. And this is before Benjamin was even born. But he would let him go out to tend the sheep and not be out there very long. He even, as we know, made him a coat of many colors. So he kept showing Joseph all this favoritism. But he was a shepherd. And in his life, he became a household servant. He became a slave. He became a convict. He became an administrator of prisons. He 
He became the chief steward of Egypt, and he came, became second in command only to Pharaoh. Now, that's kind of his life cycle. He was born in Mesopotamia, lived there until he was six years old. When he was six, Jacob moved his family from Mesopotamia, which is in the northeastern part above the Mediterranean Sea, and he moved them to Canaan, which was some 400-something miles. Mm -hmm. Lived in a town, born in a town called Haran. Haran lies in the northeast corner of the Euphrates and the Tigris mm -hmm. rivers, and it sits right between them. It actually is just southwest of Nineveh, uh, Jonah's favorite place. Uh, There, were, there was a time when he was 17 years old. He had two dreams, and he made the fatal mistake of, of telling those dreams. He was always braggadocious. He was prideful. But when he had these dreams, he, he told his brothers. They were out in his dream. They were collecting grain. They, were, they, they bundled grain back then. They would take a sieve and they'd cut it, and then they would bundle it. And that all of them were out there gathering grain, gathering wheat. And all of their bundles were bowing down to his bundle. That was the first dream. The second dream, there was a sun, <coughs> excuse me, the sun, S-U-N, which was Jacob. There was the moon, which was Rachel. And then there were 11 stars. And all of them were bowing down to Joseph. Well, that was about the straw that broke the camel's back right there. When he let them know that he, in his dream, saw himself as being supreme over them. Uh, it was... I'll make sure I was right. It was Reuben. Reuben actually wanted to kill him. That was Reuben's... I'm sorry. Simeon wanted to, and, and Judah. Simeon and Judah wanted to kill him. It was Reuben who said, no, we can't do that. He's the oldest, and he's kind of one that they look up to. So they came up with a plan. After Reuben had gone off to do something, Judah puts him in the cistern, drops him down in the cistern. Later on, if another caravan comes by, they're traitors. They're going to Egypt. They sell him to the traitors. When he gets to Egypt, one of the buyers of the merchandise that had been brought by this caravan was a man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar was the um, uh, captain of the guard at the palace. He was in charge of all the prisons and the dungeons and all that kind of stuff. And he bought Joseph to make him a household servant, a household slave. It didn't take him long to realize that this was an intelligent young man. He was a quick learner, and it wasn't but just a short period of time. The Bible doesn't say, nor does the other readings say exactly how long, but eventually Potiphar just turned everything over to him. He said, you know, you just run my household. And the, one of the quotes was that the only thing he wanted to worry about was where his food was coming from. So he, gave, he turned it all over to Joseph. Now, Potiphar's wife was evidently a pistol. <coughs> Didn't take her long to recognize this, this young, handsome Joseph. And she started pursuing him. He kept rebuking her advances over and over and over. And then one day he's going through the house and she reaches and grabs his outer cloak and he pulls away and he runs out of the house. Later on that afternoon, Potiphar comes in <clears throat> and she tells Potiphar her side of the story that it Joseph had been one to instigate everything, and so he was furious. He was only furious on the outside. Because if he had really believed that Joseph had done that, in all three of the readings that I read, they, were, they said that, he, that Potiphar would have had him killed. There's no question about it. So he had to have had reservations in his own mind that Joseph was even guilty. But to save face... He had to do something, so he put him in prison, in a dungeon.
while he's in, while he's in prison, I guess that would be a good place to sit and think because you don't have a lot of other things you're going to do while you're in there, particularly the kind of prisons they had back then. <clears throat> but he had time to think about his life. <clears throat> and he started realizing just how, how he had lived and how he was treating other people. And one day, there's a man that's in the same part of the prison with him who had originally been a cupbearer for the pharaoh. And he, he tells Joseph that he's had this dream, but he doesn't know what it means. And he's talking. He doesn't know at this time that Joseph even can interpret dreams. So he's, he's telling Joseph about his dream, and he said, you know what it means? And he said, it means that you're going to be returned to your profession. You're going to be released from prison, and you will go back to doing what you were doing. Well, a little bit, it doesn't say how much longer, but later on, the baker, I don't know something about these people serving the Pharaoh. They must, I don't know what they did, but they got thrown in the, dun, in the dungeon. But the baker comes to him and says, I've had this dream. I understand you've interpreted one for my friend. What, what does this mean to me? And they, uh, Joseph says, it means you're going to be hanged. Uh, I can imagine getting that. But by the way, both of those dreams, both of those interpretations came true. The cupbearer went back to Pharaoh, and the other man was hanged. It says that about two years later, can you imagine, seven, what, 700 days later or something like that? Oh, no, excuse me. Yeah, about 700-something days later. Because the cupbearer had said, since you helped me, I'm gonna, I'll help you. Well, I'm sure that Joseph's saying, okay, I need you to come on and help me here. So 700-something days later, the... Um, Pharaoh has been having dreams. He's having repeatedly the same dream. And he had called in all the people in Egypt that supposedly can interpret dreams, and nobody could tell him what that meant. He even called them in from Canaan and the surrounding areas. Nobody could tell him what the dreams meant. The cupbearer says to him, well, there's a guy down here in prison, in your, in your dungeon, that interpreted my dream, and it came true. He interpreted the baker's dream, and that came true. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, brought him before him, and he says, I've had these, these dreams, and I understand you can tell me what they mean. He said, I can't do that, but God can. He had made the evolution that it wasn't all evolving around him at this point. He realized that his gifts and his life and everything about it were all gifts of God. So that was his first step. The Pharaoh said, I've seen Seven very fat cows grazing in the delta, the Nile Delta, which is the plushest part of, of Egypt. And in that same dream, there are seven skinny cows that are eating the fat cows. And then I had a second dream, and that was there were seven bundles of wheat, the finest, nicest grain you've ever seen, but they're being eaten by, the, by seven bundles of the worst grain you've ever seen. Joseph said, that means that you're going to have, Egypt is going to have seven years of plenty, seven years of abundance. But it's going to be followed by seven years of a very bad drought and famine. So the Pharaoh says, okay, what do we do? He's talking to his, I guess his cabinet, if you will. So what do we do? How do we prepare for this? Well, they couldn't come up with a consensus. So he finally turns to Joseph and he says, what would you do? And he said, <clears throat> first thing I would do is find the most trustworthy, loyal individual and put them in charge of it, of everything. The second thing I would do is to make sure that he has the authority throughout your kingdom here to do what needs to be done and wherever it needs to be done. And to also make sure that wherever you build these storehouses to store this stuff. He said, we're going to save one-fifth of everything that's grown in Egypt. Any type of food store that can be preserved and saved, we're going to store it away, one-fifth of it, for the next seven years. Make sure the buildings are in a location that you can protect them. Because when this famine comes, even the surrounding areas, when a person gets hungry, they'll do whatever they have to do to get food. So he... Pharaoh was just really impressed by his, 
his ability to think this thing through. So he makes him the chief steward of agriculture in Egypt, which is a real high honor. Then he makes him the second in command only to him. And, and think about it, he's Hebrew. Not an Egyptian, but he's now in second in command under Pharaoh. Genesis 41, 38 says, and Pharaoh is talking to his officials. He says, the spirit of God is, this in, the, is in this man. See, I started running over myself there. The spirit of God is in this man. We cannot find anyone else like him. He's asking the question, can we? And then in, on down it says, he turns to Joseph and he says, you will be in charge of my palace and all of my people must obey you throughout the land. I will be greater than you because I sit on the throne. That interpretation is saying, but you're going to be number two. The thing that hit me right there was he's been in prison, we know, at least two years. I mean, it was probably, by the way, when all this happened, Joseph is now 30 years old. So he's been in Egypt in some place or other for 13 years because he was, he was taken as a slave at 17. But I thought about he, he wakes up in prison just like he does every day. Doesn't, he shouldn't be able to expect anything's going to happen different in his life because it, happened for the, it hasn't for the last at least two years. Then he's brought before Pharaoh. He has given up being self-centered, egotistical, prideful. And he stands before Pharaoh... And it's in a matter of minutes, he has gone from dungeon to a prince-like person. And it made me realize, because there, I, there are a lot of similarities in our characters, I would have to say. It's it, when you're at the end of the rope, when you are at a place that there is no place else to go, and all we have left is God. We have enough. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Malcolm. Today's verse will be Romans chapter 8. Verses 6 through 11. For to be carnally, mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if needed in if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of christ he is not his and if christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mor mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And that is saying that all of us would be in the first category if Jesus hadn't offered us a way out. Once he has said yes to Jesus, he will want to continue following him because his ways brings life and peace. Daily we must con con seriously choose to center our lives on God, us, the Bible, to discover God's guidelines and then follow them. The Holy Spirit is God's promise or guarantee of eternal life for those who believe in him. I'm going to read my book, Jesus Calling, by Sarah Young. Waiting is not 
an easy thing to do. But there's a lot of it in this world. You wait for birthdays to come. You wait for your ride to arrive. You wait in all kinds of lines. You even sometimes wait with worry for bad things that never happen. Waiting on me is different. You are waiting for the perfect timing of my plans in your life. Waiting on me means trusting me with every fiber of your being instead of trying to figure it all out yourself. When you trust me, when when you wait for my timing, I will fill your life with blessings. I will give you strength and joy and hope. And I will give you my presence while you wait. It is good to wait quietly for the Lord to save. Amen. Creed for on page 881, followed by the Gloria Patri. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. <laughs> and one other announcement I failed to say anything about. Those of us that have the little group that sings, we're going to stay after service for a few minutes, not sure how long, and decide what we're going to sing next Sunday night, and maybe practice a little bit. Is that all right? If it's not, that's just too bad. <laughs> there you go. Is that right? Sure. I mean, you know. Amen. 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 We know who the boss is around here. But, <laughs> and then there's Bonnie. We've got several bosses around here. Malcolm, he's a boss. Oh, uh, you know, prayer time is such a wonderful time. And then there's sometimes when we 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 come together and for prayer that there's just times that we um, we just kind of feel sad, like to remember Emory Renfro family. And Emery was the husband of Carol Faye Winters um, Renfro, Renfro, and he passed away um, the night before last. And uh, so we just need to remember Carol Faye and, and Emery's family. And then Robert Farmer family. Coach Farmer passed away this week, and um, service was this past Friday. We need to remember his family as well. Um, Janice Ag is in the hospital. She's in ICU, and she's been in ICU for over a week now. need to remember Janice Ag and her family as well, Robert is her brother, and um, 
need to remember them. Are there others that we would like to add or update? Oh, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have already heard this morning there was an accident on I-24 West just past the Pleasant View exit, which you could see a lot of that coming over here this morning, but um, they've closed off exit 24 and exit 19. There was a two-vehicle accident, and it happened, I think it was at 2.08 this morning. There's six children, ranging in age from one to 18 years old, who are deceased. They took one person to Skyline Medical Center in serious condition, and from what I understand, the mother was sent to Vanderbilt with life-threatening injuries. And the person that was in the other car, apparently they were alone in that car. They've been arrested, they are in custody, and um, charges are pending at this point. But that sounds, it just sounds like it's pretty much an entire family. And so we just need, we, we, we don't know them, but we know that there's going to be a lot of hurting people, and it's time to lift them up as well. Are there any others that we'd like to add to the list? Of course, there's tornado victims in Mississippi and Alabama. Yes, sir. Larry Trembleton. Temple Templeton. Anyone else? Donnie Mac. Bright, Donnie Mac Wright. Anyone else? Yes, sir. And that's Christy and Davy Hopper. They they are brother and sister. And then Josh Gatlin is Kathy's um, son. And uh, Christy had surgery on her mutual valve, and so she's having some pain from that. Uh, Davy has been having um, kidney problems due to diabetes, and Josh, I'm guessing, has been having some problems still with um, stomach issues. We had him on our prayer list for a couple of years due to that. <clears throat> Pancreatitis and that type thing. Yes, sir. Good. Good. I'm glad Kay's doing well. And Mickey White can come off, okay? Okay, good. I've got an update. It's, it's not for sure, but you know, our my uh, niece Angela Gregory's been sick for so long, right? An undiagnosed illness, and um, she went to a different doctor, and they're doing tests, but they think that she has a cranial, uh, a cranial spinal fluid leak. Oh, really? And if that is the problem. It can be fixed. Uh -huh. So we're we're hopeful at least someone is going in a different direction. Yeah. So please continue to lift her up in prayer. Maybe maybe this will all be over soon. Yeah, that's so, Angela Gregory. We've yeah. had her on prayer list for a while. She's dropped down to what was it, ninety something pounds? No, she's down to about seventy five. And so she's down to seventy five yeah. now. And, um uh, so if if they can fix this, that would be amazing. Pardon? Bruce's wife. Bruce's wife can come off. <clears throat> okay. Anyone else? Are there any joys we'd like? Oh. Go ahead. Uh, 
We can do that. I have a joy. And we hope Rusty gets to feeling better. I have a joy. What is your joy? Well, my three youngest wild ones are picking them up Saturday in Chattanooga. Oh, so that's not, that's not Frank. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's a fourth. So I'm picking him up for, uh, Saturday uh, to come for us to stay with us for Easter break until Wednesday. Oh, good. So they'll be here for uh, Easter breakfast and uh, our singing. Oh, good. Yes. Good deal. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, was in the song we saw Woodrow? Yes, yes, we did get to see Woodrow. Yeah, he he wanted more food. But it's always great when Woodrow comes to visit, even if he does come mainly for the food. But, you know, I hope, I hope we all come for some kind of food. Any other joys, concerns? Update on Jeffrey. He has been, he's, he's, um, back at the house here in Springfield and doing pretty good. He had a birthday mm -hmm. and had a happy birthday, I believe. He turned 58, 59, 58, 59, and uh, enjoyed some cake and some balloons and sang some Elvis songs, and so he was doing pretty good. So hopefully he can come back with this soon. Yes, sir. The sanctuary is packed today. <laughs> Malcolm, I can always count on you to lift spirits in this place. And that's wonderful. Any other joys, concerns? One of my favorite prayers that I pray pretty much every night is, God, just please send people to Palestine that need Palestine. And um, I don't announce that, but if people could come experience the kind of love that everybody in this place hands out, there wouldn't be room in Springfield. Amen. Just saying. If you disagree with me, then there's the door. <laughs> but don't you dare get up and go out of it. <laughs> Let's bow. Let's bow. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have given us. We thank you for each day that you give us to, to start over again to start the mornings with praise on our lips and joy in our hearts. And Father, sometimes by the end of the day, we remember the times that we have turned away from you. We remember the times during the day that we've denied you. We, we remember the times during the day that we should have confessed, we should have offered our love, we should have acted in your spirit and in, and in your character and have failed. Forgive us the times that we think that we have the power. Forgive us the times that we deny and think we're stronger. Forgive us the times that we overlook and we realize that we're not looking through your eyes. Father, every day, help us to be more like Christ. Help us to, to stop and think that any power that we think we have, any mercy that we think we give out, and any grace that may flow from us. 
is all because of you. Be with us, continue to guide us and lead us, and forgive us each and every day. Continue to lift us up and put us back on the road that leads to you. And Father, there's been many names that have been called out this morning that are on our prayer list. Um, we ask that you surround those who grieve with your presence. We ask that you fill those who are hurting with your peace. We ask that those who are fearful be made strong by your presence with them. We ask that those who may be having other problems as far as relationships or financial or any other issue, we ask that your presence complete them. We ask all of this in Christ's name, who taught his disciples to pray most perfectly by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> the text this morning is from the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, verses 1 through 14. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. <clears throat> the hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very Draw. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and I prophesied, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves. 
O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you on your own, own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. And may he add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his words. <clears throat> you know, we've joked about Timothy having a birthday yesterday. And Robert thinks he's probably about 25 years older. Of course, Robert's dream is that he was back in, you know, about 39 himself, which would make Tim about, what, 16? So they've got their dreams. And um, don't we all? Don't we all have our dreams? And, you know, sometimes those dreams are smashed. There's been a lot of dreams I've had. A lot of them have not come true. I wanted a horse. Well, it didn't come at the time I wanted it to come and still don't have one. What are you laughing about, Malcolm? I used to barrel race. I know what it's about. My bones will be broken right now if I got up on the back of a horse and tried to do it. But, you know, sometimes our dreams don't happen. Sometimes other things happen, and we have to give up dreams. We have to give up goals. We have to give up the things that we think matter most to us. Sometimes it could be somebody else's fault. Sometimes it can be our fault. But there comes a time when it doesn't really matter whose fault it is or who we think we can blame. What matters most is the faith that we have and where we place that faith. Because, you know, we could place it on idols. We could place it on Satan for all that matters. I don't want to say his name too loud because I don't want him to know that we said anything about him this morning. We could place that faith on another person. So where we place our faith at has a lot to do with a lot of stuff that happens in our lives. You know, we can, we can blame things on... Well, Bonnie made that coffee too hot, and that's why I spilled it down the front of my shirt. Well, it's not Bonnie's fault that you're clumsy. She makes good coffee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She does. I love it. <clears throat> Ezekiel had <clears throat> Ezekiel had um, had dreams of his own too. He dreamed that one day he was going to be a priest. And he was excited because every day he would pass the temple that Solomon built. And he'd pass by that and he'd say, one day I'm going to be a priest. And one day people are going to come to me and I'll be able to serve God and I'll be able to serve his people. That was his dream. Jewish law stated that a priest, well, he'd have to be 30 years old before he could even be considered. So he was looking forward to that. He was going to move up into the ranks. And his dream, when he turned 30, would come true. But while he was looking forward to becoming a priest, the people of Israel were having a party. They were, I mean, it was, they had a great time going. I mean, it was, a, they had a strong financial economy. 
So there wasn't any worries. And they thought, well, we're just going to do what we want to do. And they were having a grand old time. They were having some parties. They were doing their thing, which was probably a lot of it triple X rated. But um, you get the picture. It might remind some of us of where we are right now. They were also worshiping other things. They had their own idols that they were worshiping. They'd forgotten about God. They'd forgotten, hey, you know, he's the reason we're waking up. He's the reason that we have dreams. He's the reason that we have a house with running water. He's the reason that we have food on our table. They'd forgotten all about that. They had forgotten to worship and serve the God that created them. So, at one point God said, you know what? You people are either going to repent or I'm going to remove you. They said, who are you to tell us what to do? Makes my toes curl. Who are you to tell us what to do? When they refused to repent and turn back to God, he reminded them of who they were. He sent the Babylonian army to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And destroy it, they did. Men, women, children, all massacred. That was about 600 years prior to Jesus. Didn't matter, young, old, massacred every single one of them. Well, most of them. There were so many bodies that there weren't enough people left to bury them. All they could do was pile them up out in the desert. And leave them there for the vultures. That's all they could do. The ones that were not slaughtered were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. As history tells it, Ezekiel was about 25 years old when all that happened. Only five years away from obtaining his goal, he finds himself, instead of in a temple, in rags, homeless, scrounging for food. It's it's amazing how quick things can change, isn't it? One day you're up, the next day you're about as low that you could scratch up, you could reach up and scratch your ant's belly. I mean, you know, they were all without a future. They were all without hope. At that point, they knew what it was to be without God. But it didn't keep Ezekiel down. That man started opening his mouth. He started talking about God. He started preaching his name. He started sharing his spirit. Hmm. So God takes Ezekiel by the hand and he places him in the middle of all those dried up, sun-bleached bones that have been weathered, that have been blown around, that have been moved around by animals. Thousands of bones, and he takes them and he places them there. It's in the center of a graveyard of bones. Israelites 
all of them slaughtered right there. That's where all those bones are. So he places him in the middle of those bones. And in a matter of speaking, he's probably saying to Ezekiel, you know, you think you got it bad? Look here. Look how bad this is. There's nothing left of these people but bones. You think maybe they might know who I am now? Why don't, why don't you prophesy to these bones? You tell them. Come on. <laughs> he starts. He asked the impossible. Ezekiel, can these bones live? He answered him correctly. Well, you know, you're, you're the only one that knows God. You're the only one that knows. We know what the answer is. Those bones started coming back together just as soon as Ezekiel started prophesying about those bones. They came together piece by piece, joint to joint, muscle to muscle, flesh. Finally, they came together. But Ezekiel looked and he said, you know what? Yeah, they, they may have come back together, but there's not a spirit within them. So God told him to prophesy about the breath. And then God breathed his breath into all those people and moved them back to the land that he had taken them from. It's a crazy story, but it's an amazing story because how many people here have felt like your bones were absolutely dried up, that you weren't good for nothing, that maybe God had forgotten about you, that that you don't have a word to speak to anybody. That you're useless. Maybe you've been told that from a child. I don't know. I don't know what your story is. I don't need to know what your story is. I got a pretty good idea we all share kind of the same story somewhere along the way. But where are you right now? Does God need to breathe new life into you? And if he tried, would you accept that? Or would you say, no, 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 I, I can't. I can't do anything for you. I can't do anything for me, much less do anything for you. And you fail to realize that God's trying. But you've got to be receptive. God told Ezekiel, my people are just like these bones. My people are just like these bones. Tell them I'm going to give them life. And I want them to live. Tell them I'm going to put my spirit in them. And they will live again. Wintertime, I think, maybe puts us in a position of where we think we just need to hibernate all the time. You know, we get in that comfortable spot, and it's like, mm, sweatshirts feel good, you know, those nice blankets feel good, and we just want to stay there because that's so comfortable. God doesn't care about our comfort. We have to think about Jesus on a cross. The people of Israel were thinking about their fun, their comfort, 
they wound up in the Valley of Dry Bones. We have to think, where does God want to use me that will make me so uncomfortable that all I can do is turn around and praise his name? Because I know I'm going to need him that much. I know I can't take another step without him being right there for sure. Those are questions we got to ask ourselves. Because it's not until we want it that he's going to fill us. You know, I don't know how our lives, I don't have the answers. I mean, I, I don't. I do not have the answers. I know where I've been. I hope I know where I'm going. Where's our faith? Does it fly out the window when we see a challenge? Do we say no when we see somebody that maybe we think, oh, I'm sure they don't need my help? And all the other questions that maybe we ask ourselves during the week. I may not have the answers. You may not have the answers. But if we're really serious about it, we know who does. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.